Pro Tools video time once again and this time we're going to be having a look at seven Pro Tools features which are perhaps less commonly used than some of the others. Some of these are very useful, others perhaps less so, but judge for yourself whether or not you'll find them useful. So first of all we're starting off with plugin settings auto increment. Any stock Avid plugins and third party plugins which use the standard Pro Tools plugin preset system, which is this part of the plugin window, will allow you to automatically cycle through plugin presets by clicking on the plugin setting select button which is this one here. At the top of this window you'll see the current folder. Many plugins just store all of their presets in one folder. Some however categorise them into subfolders as you can see in this 7 band EQ. So I'm currently in the drum overheads folder. And if I just move this out of the way so we can see uh, the plugin as well, I can easily select any of these and it will recall that preset onto the plugin. But we've also got this increment option at the bottom right. This allows you to automatically cycle through all of the plugin presets in that folder sequentially at a time interval specified in seconds here. So for example if I click on this, this is set to one second, it'll skip through these presets once every second. Maybe it's more practical to do it every three seconds. So can go through them like that, listen to the result. When you find one that you're happy with, you can click done and it will apply it. If you missed it, that doesn't matter. So let's say I wanted this splashy overheads preset to, to be the one. If it cycles past it, don't worry, just turn off increment, select it, click done, and you've recalled that preset to the plugin. I can probably demonstrate this better actually with a, a reverb plugin. So you've got Dverb and I'll just send some of this dialogue to the reverb. We all train really hard together, but we don't just train individually, we train as a whole group. And it's amazing to compare it to different people in different locations. The, the set okay, so if I wanted to cycle through these, I could run the audio, we all train really hard click together, here, but we don't just train choose to increment it every however many seconds, to compare it to different people click on this, in different locations. The, the and then it'll cycle the through those presets. The, the friendship we have, the bonds that we have, and the training that we develop. So that's the level of community I see um, from, from Parkour in Manchester. And then when I find the one I like, just click done. And then it's chosen that preset and we've applied it. The second feature which I'd like to talk about is restore last selection. So if you previously had an edit selection like this, and then you lose it by clicking elsewhere in the timeline, you can easily restore it by going to the edit menu and choosing restore last selection. Alternatively, you can use the shortcut Option Command Z and it will do the same thing. As well as allowing you to get back to your previous selection, this feature can also be used to toggle between two different edit selections quickly without having to use memory locations. So say for example I had that and I also wanted a selection which encompassed that range. Well, I can just use the Restore Last Selection command once again. So Restore Last Selection or Option Command Z. And if I do that again from the keyboard, you can see it will alternate between those two edit selections. So across the course of mixing and editing that could be a very useful feature because it allows you to switch between two different selections without having to resort to using memory locations. The third feature I'd like to mention is the Consolidate Clip 1kHz sine wave feature. You've probably used the Consolidate Clip function before, it can be accessed from the edit menu or there's a shortcut which goes with it which is Option Shift 3 and it will of course consolidate those clips into a new clip actually creating new audio on the drive. However, if you use the keyboard shortcut but add control in as well, then it can render a really useful sound wave. So you can see, once again, keyboard shortcut is usually Option Shift 3, but if I do Option Shift Control 3, then we get this rendered 1 kHz sound wave, which is at minus 20 dBFS. So this is sometimes useful when you're working on broadcast programs. Rarely used feature number 4 is the rectified and power view options for waveforms. These can be accessed from the view menu under waveforms. Rectified waveforms are displayed so that their positive and negative waveform excursions are actually summed together and displayed as a single positive value as you can see here. The idea of this is to let you see more detail in the waveforms when using some of the smaller track heights. So for example if I was in MINI, maybe that would be more useful under certain circumstances. Some people might use this perhaps when editing volume automation data because volume levels are shown as starting at the bottom of the track. Personally, I don't use this feature, but you might find it useful. I'll just switch it off for now. You'll see that we also have the option of displaying waveforms in either peak or power displays. Peak is the default setting and allows you to easily see the sample by sample peak level of the audio. 
The power view, which I'll just switch on now, will change how the waveforms are displayed as you can see here. So the waveform display is calculated according to the root mean squared or RMS value. Power view can be used for normal or rectified waveform views. For music mastering in particular, it can give a better indication of the sonic characteristics of the audio than peak view. But again, judge for yourself whether or not you find it useful. And make sure that when you don't need power view, you switch the waveforms back to peak. Feature number five is the metadata inspector. This was introduced in Pro Tools 12.2 and you can find it under the window menu. As you can see, it lets you view metadata about the session. So certain fields can be edited such as title, artist, contributors and location. Other fields are fixed, so we've got sample rate, bit depth, date created, date modified and BPM. Where you've got a range of tempos in the session, this will actually display that. So it might say 120 to 140 beats per minute, for example. All of this information is stored with the session in the PTX file itself. And you can also view all of this metadata in browser windows. The sixth feature is slip grid mode. This is actually fairly widely used, but some people aren't aware of it, so I thought I'd mention it here. Sometimes you might want edit selections to conform to the grid, but retain the freedom to edit audio in slip mode. So rather than switching between these two modes, you can just select either one of them, shift click on the other one, and then both are highlighted, which indicates that we're in slip grid mode. Now, timeline selections will be based on the grid, as you can see it's snapping to it, but everything else operates as slip so I can freely move audio or I can trim audio and it won't be constrained by the underlying grid value. The seventh and final rarely used feature is the cursor location indicator. This is found at the top of the edit window and it will display different information depending on what you're hovering the mouse over. On MIDI and instrument tracks it displays note values so if you're drawing in MIDI it can be a useful reference. It also displays the actual timeline location Again, this isn't necessarily where the playhead is currently located, it's where the mouse is currently hovering. On audio tracks in volume view, the note value indicator instead displays volume, so depending on where the cursor is, once again it will display the equivalent value, this time in decibels. When audio tracks are in waveform view, however, the display changes to indicate quantization levels. I'm yet to find a practical use for this, but you'll notice that in this 16-bit session, the range goes from plus to minus 32,768, depending on where the cursor is. This actually makes sense if you know how to calculate the number of quantization levels for any given bit depth. So for fixed point audio, it's basically 2 to the power of the bit depth. So 2 to the power of 16, for example, gives us 65,536 possible quantization levels. Divide this by 2 and we get 32,768, which is what we see here. I'm just going to change this session to 24-bit for a second. And we now have a significantly greater resolution. So let's just calculate this in terms of quantization levels. So it's going to be 2 to the power of 24, which is 16,777,216. Divide this by 2 and we get... 8,388,608. So now, if I move the mouse up and down here across some audio, you can see it alternates between plus and minus that value, 8.3 million. Finally, I'll just set the session to 32-bit float. And for 32-bit floating point sessions, it works differently. And the values, as you can see, are indicated on a plus to minus one scale for reasons which are probably too boring to go into now. Anyway, that's it for now. I hope you found at least something in this video useful, and I'll see you again soon.